amen to that. Hey, let's pray together, family. Jesus, thank you for your goodness and your mercy. Your word says in Psalm 37 through David, he says, Do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. It only causes harm. Verse 23, the steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord, and he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down. Jesus, thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you for this beautiful church that you have us in. Lord, uh, we're often sometimes uh, so much in a hurry to run into your presence and just tell you all of the needs and concerns that we have. And this morning, Jesus, we just want to say thank you. Thank you for the cars that we drove here in, and thank you for the bed we woke up in, and for the pillow we had. Thank you for the refrigerator that has something in it. <laughs> Jesus, thank you that we're able to put our socks on this morning. Thankful for um, whatever health that we currently have, Jesus. Uh, we just want to say thank you. Uh, life's not perfect. Some portions hurt a little bit, Jesus. But we just want to say thank you for what we have. Thank you for what you're doing. We know you have a great plan for our lives, so we just want to say thank you, Jesus. We ask your blessings on uh, Pastor Ty up at Yucca Valley, uh, Life Point, um, Chris at Wildwood, Fellowship of the Past, uh, Citizens Church, Jerry on Highland, uh, the Assemblies Church on Beaumont Avenue. We pray for uh, your churches, and we pray for those that aren't preaching your word, that you would convict them to preach your word. Jesus, and we pray for uh, this, this community that you would use us to uh, reach them. Pray for marriages and for healings. Uh, do a great work. We want to pray for Angel uh, that's still um, uh, battling Jesus. Pray for marriages. We pray that you would do great things uh, in us and through us today. Give us ears to hear, Jesus. We want to hear from you and give us some, uh, some courage to respond. We ask these things in the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone said... Amen. Hey, please have a seat. Beautiful day outside. Feels nice in here, so I'll be about an hour and a half or so. Some of you are like, no, we got to go eat. Hey, just a few quick announcements for you. Um, let's keep the uh, youth and prayer. They went up to Hume, I think around 4 or 5 o'clock this morning. They should be uh, reaching Hume soon. Hume is awesome. Uh, for several reasons. One, it'll be awesome for the young people because their cell phone will not work. <laughs> the only way to make a phone call is by a pay phone, and you know that they probably don't know how to use that guy. <laughs> so uh, your kids are safe if they're up at Hume. Uh, they're going to hear a lot about Jesus. They're going to have uh, some great times at uh, what they call chapel. It's going to be beautiful. So let's pray for them that when they get back that we would just keep encouraging them. Then also on July 29th, we're going to have VBS, Vacation Bible School here. So if you have kids or grandkids, bring them on out from July 29th to August 2nd. You can sign up in the Welcome Gazebo. The um, title of that is Shipwrecked but Rescued by Jesus. So you want to bring them out to that. It's going to be great. We also have a marriage class uh, starting up really soon. Make sure you stop by the Welcome Gazebo to sign up for that. It'll be um, on Sunday morning starting really soon. So make sure you get involved in that if you are married. You guys ready to go today? Yes. This side's ready. You guys ready? You guys ready? All right. Yay, yeah, yeah, let's start a wave. Hey, so, uh, so today we're going to start um, 2 John. And what's great about continually coming to church is that you get a flavor of an entire book. So whenever someone mentions a, um, maybe a verse from 1 John, you're going, 
hey, I know exactly what 1 John is all about. So keep on coming to church as we talk, uh, go verse by verse through the Bible. We're going to keep growing. We're going to keep learning. Well, 2 John was written by, guess who? 1 John. And let me give you just a little bit of background. Uh, the Apostle John, he's called the Elder, and he is the last remaining apostle that uh, has walked with Jesus. He's seen the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus. So he is the elder. So whenever John is speaking, everyone's going, okay, this guy has been with Jesus. So he's around 90 plus years of uh, years age. Um, he's writing this letter from a place called Ephesus. And this letter is pretty unique because he's writing it to a person. Um, he calls her um, uh, Electa. He, um, uh, most uh, commentators believe he's writing to an elect lady, and instead of naming her, he just says elect lady and her children because the persecution in the area is great. You guys kind of hot in here? Yeah. Couple of you, all right. Can we kick that, kick that down? He's like, no. They're like, no. Yes. Here, here's some water. So fan yourself. Do something, I guess. Back to the message. So, um, so John is writing to this, uh, this, uh, this elect lady and her children. He doesn't name her by name because there's some persecution going on. So uh, some commentators believe that it's, uh, as metaphorically speaking, that John is actually talking about the church. So whether it's a person, a lady, and her children, or the church, God has some great things for us to learn today. Just a couple of uh, notes here that in these 13 verses, truth is mentioned five times and love is mentioned five four times. So truth and love are some really, really great bookends. Truth and love. And I was thinking this week, rhetorical question, something for you to think about. Can we have truth without love? And then can we have love without truth? Something to kind of think about. So John today is going to talk to us a lot about truth and a lot about love. So the title of the message this morning is Truth is Everything. Truth is Everything. So turning your Bibles to 2 John, and if you're new to following you some Jesus, that is in the New Testament right after. Look at that. Good job, guys. Good job. 2 John, when you get there, give me an amen. 2 John, it says. 2 John, it says, The elder to the elect lady and her children, whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also all those who have known the truth, because of the truth which abides in us will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with you from God the Father and uh, let me break it right. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with you from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. Verse 4. I rejoiced greatly that I have found some of your children walking in truth as we have received commandment from the Father. Now I plead with you, lady, not as though I write a new commandment to you, but that which we have had from the beginning that we love one another. Listen to verse 6. This is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment that you have heard from the beginning. You should walk in it. Let's stop there for just a couple of minutes. If you're taking some notes and filling in your bulletins, our first point this morning is that truth determines the bounds of love. Truth determines the bounds of love, or we could say truth determines the parameters of our love. Think about this. You and I love one another simply because Jesus loves us. I was thinking that 16 months ago, I knew mostly none of you. But since we've been spending some time together, talking about some Jesus, eating some food from time to time, we begin to have this fellowship. We begin to, to know one another. We begin to have this love that has grown. And what's crazy is that most of you would understand this, that we're closer to one another than we are to most of our blood relatives. That we, we, we talk about Jesus. We're loving one another. We're spending time with, none, with one another. And it's this thing called truth. When we heard the truth of Jesus, 
it has transformed us. It's just this truth of Jesus that has made all the difference in, 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 in our lives. I'm thinking that Jesus, once we hear your truth, it has changed the way we think. It's changed the way we walk. It's, it's changed the way we, we talk. And it's this, this love of Jesus that says, my love that was only this big, it then starts to grow like this, and then it starts to go like this, and then it starts to get deeper and deeper and deeper. Listen to what the Bible says in 1 Peter. Peter says, since you have purified your souls in what? Obeying the truth. There's that word again. It says, through the spirit in sincere love of the brethren. It says, love one another fervently with a pure heart. That it's this truth that God says, love one another fervently. What if we were to take this literally? What if we were to say, okay, Jesus, I'm going to love one another fervently in my home. Who's ever in my home, I'm going to love them fervently. Now, you might say, hey, pastor, man, you don't know who's in my home. <laughs> we need some help. There's no asterisk by any scriptures at all. He says, love one another fervently. So what if, rhetorical question, if we all went home and we loved who's ever in our home fervently? Now, you might be thinking, well, I have no one in my home. What if you love the person in your row, the people in your row fervently? I'm sure when everyone said, hey, how are you doing today? Everyone said, fine, I'm good, I'm blessed. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. The next time you shake someone's hand and you ask them how they're doing and they say, fine, tilt your head to the left and say, really? How are you really doing? When they say, oh, I'm doing good, tilt it to the other side and say, okay, if you're not doing good, there's some sugary goodness in the donut shack over there. We can have some coffee and we can talk about anything you want to talk about. Why? Because the truth says that you and I should love one another with a fervent love. The truth says that our love cannot just be be shallow that our love can't just be like hey i'm happy to see you today really we say that to complete strangers hey how's it going no but the the church of jesus we need to love one another fervently this theme of love is all throughout the bible listen to what to what jesus says it says a new commandment i give to you that you should what love one another now let's stop there for a second we're like okay possibly i can maybe do that but Jesus follows up. He says, love one another as I have loved you. Uh-oh. That's the issue. Loving one another as Jesus has loved us. You know how Jesus is really good to forgive us, like, all the time? You know how we're so bad at forgiving people? We're like, Jesus, forgive me. I blew it again. He's like, yeah, of course, yeah. Someone else wrongs us they're like hey forgive me I i'm so sorry and we're like you know what let me think about it god's going what god i blew it you know what let me think about forgiving you i'll get back to you in seven to ten days when you act better god forgives us but yet we take our time forgiving people well i'm just not too sure if i'm going to forgive you again what if, what if god said that to us you know what i'm not sure if i'm going to forgive you again you know what, we've been talking about the same issue over and over and over again. God pardons us, but yet we're slow to pardon others. Jesus says, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. First Thessalonians, no greater love has no man in this than he laid down his life for his friends. So this thing called love, it starts with this thing called truth, just stretching us and expounding our, our thing called love. Listen to what truth says in verse 2. It says, because of the truth which abides in us will be in us forever. The truth will never one day decide to stand up and walk out of our lives. The truth is with us forever. Maybe this has happened to you. You know, you're doing your thing and called life, and you start veering to the, to the left. Some of you have the cars that say, dit, 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 dit. I do not have one of those cars. <laughs> and some of you know, if you start to drift a little bit, it lets you know you are, you are drifting. A little bit then it, it, it brings you it you, you, you come back sometimes we we go this way and, and our truth meter says hey you're drifting it's called conviction you know like you you, you probably shouldn't do something like some of you probably shouldn't have got a donut this morning 
you were walking to the shack and you said, you know what, I'm just going to get some coffee. And then someone said, you want some of this? They wafted it over to you. You said, you know what, I, yeah, I can just have one. The internal doot, 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 doot said, said no. The truth inside you said, you know that's going to make your sugar level go up like that. The truth is in us. And what's great is that the truth abides in us forever. This thing called truth is a beautiful thing. To abide means to, to dwell and to remain. That the truth is inside of us. Is that not exciting? Inside of us is the Holy Spirit who is truth. He says, hey, don't go that way. Hey, this is, this is your path here. Stay on this path that it's with us and it abides with us forever. It gets even better. Listen to verse 3. It says, grace, mercy, and peace will be with you from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and in love. So we have here blessings from above. Uh, grace means to receive something that you don't deserve, like living, stuff like that. You guys okay? Yeah. Okay. God's given us something that we don't, don't deserve. Mercy is not getting what we do deserve. And then God gives us this thing called peace. Think about this. God wants you and I to have peace. Think about that. God wants us to have peace. People pay for what God freely gives. We go on vacations thousands of miles away from Beaumont, Cherry Valley, Calamasa, wherever you live, thousands of miles away to get a little relaxation. Nothing wrong with that at all. But we also want some peace. But you know what happens right around the last day of vacation? You're like, man, that in basket is going to look horrible. My, my, the weeds are probably growing. All of these things are probably happening. If that's not, that's not me or Jesus, you got to hang up. <laughs> things are going all crazy, but we're 1,000 miles away. We don't have peace. God freely says, here, he freely gives us. Here's a bottle of water for my brother. That's for you. So he's, he's done nothing. I don't know if he can sing I don't know if he has some great talents. I don't know what kind of week he's had. I don't know what kind of, what, what he did before he, he, he came here to church. But I simply gave him something. And all he did is received it. What if God wants us just to receive his peace and his grace and mercy just like that? What if it's just really that simple, but yet, we sometimes we're walking past God's mercy. We're walking past his grace. We're walking past his peace. We're like, God, I'm so stressed out. He goes, yeah, I know. Here's some, here's some peace. You know how sometimes life just gets really, 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 really heavy, really busy sometimes, and we just kind of rush into God's presence, and we just rush back out. We feel the same way. Just slow down. Let me give you some peace. Let me give you some grace. Let me, give you some, let me give you some mercy. When was the last time in our prayers we said, God, I just want to receive the peace that you have. Jesus, I just want to get into the boat with you. You're sleeping. I want to sleep next to you. I know the boat's not going to go down with you in it. I know that one day you're going to stand up and say, storm, peace, be still. So what if God wants to give us peace like right now at 1029? No way I'm answering that, huh? What if right now, right now, I know there's something going on in your mind. Something's going on in your life. What if right now at 10, 29, we just prayed and said, Jesus, I just want to simply receive that peace. You know what we should do? We should pray. Jesus, thank you for your love. Thank you for this thing called peace. Lord, you know some, some of the, the chaos that's going on in life, some of the uh, issues we're, we're having and we're experiencing, Jesus. You know that some are restless, you know, some are just filled with anxiety. So, Jesus, your word says that we just read that there's peace that's coming from you. So, Jesus, we just want to receive that peace right now. We know that all things are working together for good because we love us some Jesus, and we're called according to your purpose. So, Jesus, we just want to receive that peace. We just want to trust and believe that everything is going to work out. So, Jesus, um, we're tired of thinking about it. We're tired of worrying about it. 
We just simply want to receive your peace. We want to receive what you want to give us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Take the Bible literal. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with you from God our Father. These blessings that are from above. Because sometimes we need a reminder that there's this peace of God that he wants to give us. Paul reminded Timothy of this very same thing. He says to Timothy, a true son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ. Timothy, we know you need some grace. We know you need some mercy. We know you need some peace. And who is it coming from? It's coming from the Lord. Uh, sometimes, family, we have this, um, this view of God that he's sometimes uh, not very compassionate, that all of these things are going wrong. But here we have in our scripture that God wants to give us grace. He wants to give us mercy. He wants to give us peace. How many of you have no problem sleeping at all? I mean, you can sleep anywhere. Bless the seven of you. I mean, oh my goodness. Wow. Now, some of us, we lay our head on the pillow. We're going, bing. What are we going to do now? It's uh, one, two, three, four. I might as well get up and do some vacuum something. I wonder if we're just act too active here we should just say head on the pillow jesus got it until tomorrow shut shut the system down everything is gonna be okay jesus has ev jesus can take care of the world without me he doesn't need my help at all so you know what i just want to go to sleep jesus help us to have a beautiful sleep tonight help us jesus help us jesus to receive this grace and this mercy and this peace that can be ours just right now well, listen to verse 4. He says, I rejoice greatly that I have found some of your children walking in truth as we have received commandment from the Father. I rejoice greatly that I have found some of your children walking in truth. So number one, we have truth determines the bounds of love. And number two, the truth de determines how we walk. The truth determines how we walk to walk in the word of God, to know it, to live it. Now remember, family, all that God instructs us to do in his word, these are his commandments. It's easy to say, well, Jesus, of course I love you. We need to be like James. What does James say? Be doers of what? Of the word and not just hearers only. So we can't just say, yeah, I believe this. No, we need to be doers. We need to actively do something with the word of God. And John here says he greatly rejoices to find that some of the children are walking in truth. And those of you that, have, uh, that are parents and you got some kids and they're, you know, maybe some of you, look at kids all over, everywhere, kids everywhere. It's a beautiful thing. They're here at church. Now, maybe you were kidnapped this morning, but at least you're here. Back to the message. So what's great is that the, the, the kids, when you see them, them reading their Bibles, when you see them wanting, loving some Jesus, you see them following after Jesus. I remember a few years ago, uh, uh, my son, um, uh, he we were at church, and uh, he was next to me, and he had his hands raised. I'm like, inside I'm going. <laughs> if I could do a backflip, I would have done one. He's currently struggling in his faith. But I know, just knowing that he at that time was, was walking in truth, what a blessing it was to, because he was saying, by raising up his hands, he was saying, I acknowledge what I'm singing, that Jesus is great. And our prayer is that God will get our kids back, right? That God will bring them back into the fold, like that prodigal son. That, that Jesus, that you would just be great, that you would do great things, that since we love, we have this truth, there's a way that you and I, that you and I should walk. How is our walk going? Are we, are we walking according to what the word of God says? It's easy just to say, you know what, love me some Jesus. No, how is your love towards one another? You know, how is your walk going? Are we, are we keeping his commands? Are we praying without ceasing? Are we, are we following him? Are we abstaining from evil? Are we serving? Are we giving? Are we, are we rejoicing? John is saying, I rejoice to hear that that your kids are walking, they're, they're following the, the commands of God. And how beautiful it is. And John continues what he was saying. He says, and now I, he says, I plead with you. Hmm, that means to beg or to implore. I plead with you, lady, 
not as though I, I wrote a new commandment to you, but that which we have had from the beginning. What does he say? That we love one another. Let's stop there for a second. God, through John, is pleading with us to love. You're thinking, that's kind of crazy. Why are you pleading with us to do something as natural as, as love? Why are you pleading with us to love someone else? Maybe loving is not as natural as it should be, and sometimes those guys need some help. You know how those guys can watch somebody just totally distraught and in tears and will go like this? It's going to be all right. My wife's all, go hug them. I'm like, it's going to be good. It's all going to work out. Jonathan, I, I plead with you. I'm not telling you anything new. I'm pleading with you that you would love one another. And John says, this is the key here. It says in verse 6, this is love that we walk according to his commandments. Wait a minute, John. You're telling me this is love that we walk according to the commandments of God? I thought you are going to say that love was, you know, patient, that love is this, that love is that. No, you're saying, John, that love is walking according to the commands of God. Huh, we're going to come back to that in a second. This is the commandment that you have heard from the beginning that you should walk in it. So here we have, we have an, an old reminder. So whenever we hear the commandments of God, some may think of Charleston Heston with uh, the Ten Commandments with Moses. But the commandments of God, they grow greater than the Ten Commandments. Let me, let me give you just, just a couple of commands. We have the command in John chapter 14 to abide in Jesus. We have the command to pray without ceasing. We have the command to trust in the Lord with all of our heart and not lean on our own understanding. We have the command to pray in Jesus' name. We have the command to deny ourselves and to follow Jesus. We have the command to let our light shine. We have the command to be reconciled, to not lust, to keep our word. We have the command to love our enemies, to store up treasures in heaven, to honor our marriage, to be baptized. And it goes on and on and on. So whenever Jesus tells us something, either him physically, literally, or through someone else, these are the commands of God. So we can't just say just these 10, then I'm good. No, we need to, the command to, for instance, pray without ceasing. How many of you have ever been caught uh, talking out loud to yourself? All right. Whoa. Whoa. All right. Okay. We're to be praying without ceasing, to just be talking to God all through the day. And sometimes it comes out loud and you're thinking, did I just say that out loud? Yes, you did. Just to talk to God without ceasing. This is one of his, one of his commands. So John is letting uh, the, this, this woman know, hey, Keep the commands of God. He's letting the, the church know, keep the commands of God, that it can't just be some little tiny thing, but we need to walk in all of God's commands. Think of this. As we walk in God's commands, not only are we going to be blessed, but we're going to bless others. Think about this. If you and I were to pray without ceasing this week for the people in our row, guess who's going to be blessed for it? Everybody. People in your row and you. How wonderful is it going to be when service is over, you're going to say, hey, I'll be praying for this whole entire row this week. That's doing what the scriptures say that we should do to pray without ceasing. That's keeping God's commands. So we need to read the Bible and do exactly what it says. Listen to what Jesus says because it's easy for us to say, you know what? Jesus, you know I love you. What if Jesus says, well, let me see the fruit of your love for me. He says, if you love me, keep my commands. And no amen for that. If you love me, then he says, you need to keep my commands. And what is it, his commands, that we need to walk up a mountain in our sandals? No. Our commands are to, to love him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, to, to love one another, to serve, to give, to, to labor for one another. These are the, the commands of God. Galatians 5 is a beautiful uh, scripture. It says, for you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love, what are we to do? Serve one another. Serve one another. Don't raise your hands, though, but some of you went to the donut shack, and somebody served you some coffee and some donuts. 
Uh, this morning here, Brother Carlos is serving the church in the sound ministry. Uh, somebody is serving uh, the church by pressing a button and the words appear. Uh, Brother David is recording a service right now for YouTube for later on today. Somebody came in here this week and they were vacuuming the, the floor, serving the church. Somebody stuffed the, the back of the chairs. Why? They're just simply serving. If you have little people right now, somebody is holding them in the nursery, telling them about Jesus. If you have bigger people, somebody is reading the Bible to them about Jesus. If you have youths, somebody's in there telling them about Jesus. Why? Because it all goes back to serving one another. Through love, serve one another. So I'm always encouraging everybody. Let's everybody, let's all have in our minds to do one thing. Somebody handed you a, a bulletin as you walked in this morning. All of us can do something like that. Hey, welcome to Calvary Beaumont. We're glad you're here. Here's a piece of paper, right? Right? Here's a piece of paper, but I want to serve Jesus by serving you. Here's a piece of paper with ink on it. God bless you. Have a great day. Something that all of us can do. What are we doing? We're keeping the commands of God to serve one another. So if you're not currently not serving in, in an area, I encourage you to serve. John is now going to switch gears a little bit. He says in verse 7 and 8, it says, For many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we do not lose those things we worked for, but that we may receive a full reward. John is saying we need, to, we need to be on guard. In context, what was happening is, as a Christian back in these days, you had to be hospitable. So whenever a traveling teacher or a missionary came into your area, as a Christian, you had to house them. That was your duty, to house the traveling teachers and missionaries. That's what you had to do. Well, then John says, well, okay, that's what we used to do. Now there's a bunch of deceivers that have gone out, and they are meaning to deceive. So now that these deceivers have gone out, not only are they meaning to deceive, they don't even believe that Jesus came into the flesh. And he says, this believer, uh, this person is a deceiver and an antichrist. So what do we do with that? <laughs> We're going to talk a little bit about uh, some people that come to your door. I want to make sure that whenever someone comes to your door that you are um, amply equipped to answer their questions. This is what um, the Watchtower, or Jehovah's Witnesses, this is what they believe. According to the Watchtower Society, it says the man, Jesus, is dead. We just prayed to him a couple seconds ago. He's alive. The man, Jesus, is dead, forever dead. We deny that he was raised in the flesh and challenge any statement to that effect as being unscriptural. We're about to challenge you right now. Uh, Jesus' fleshly body was disposed of by Jehovah God. Well, first of all, Jesus is Jehovah, so that's a problem there. Uh, dissolved into its constitutive elements or atoms, whatever that means, uh, in order to convince Thomas, who was one of Jesus' disciples, of who he was he used a body with wound holes. So where do you find a body with wound holes, first of all? <laughs> and even if you use one of the thieves on the cross, they didn't look like Jesus. And we're going to get a body from anyway. Back to this. It says he was raised as an invisible spirit creature with no physical body. Okay, so let's say this. So let's say, how do we know that this is not true? Where do we go to look? Good job, everybody. Listen to what the Bible says. Uh, Paul says this. It says, For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to what? The Scriptures. And that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day, according to what? The Scriptures. After that, he was what? Seen by how many people? Over 500 brethren at one time. And when Paul wrote this, it says, Of whom the greater part remain to this present, but some have fallen asleep. Let's look at one more thing, and then we're going to move on. Turn your Bibles to Luke 24. So make a serious left turn from where you are. Luke 24. Matthew, Mark, Luke, chapter 24. As we talk about those that mean to deceive. 
And when you get there, give me an amen. amen. Luke 24, we're going to look at verses 36 through 43 as we talk about those who are meaning to deceive. Matthew, Mark, Luke chapter 24, starting at verse 36. It says this. Everybody there? Yeah. Luke 24, starting at verse 36. This is after the resurrection. It says, now as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them. So apparently Jesus is alive. Hey. Uh, stood in the midst of them, and he said to them, peace to you. But they were terrified and frightened and supposed they had seen a spirit. And he said to them, why are you troubled? And why, uh, and why uh, do doubts arise in your hearts? Listen, Jesus says, behold my hands and my feet, that it is what I myself. He says, handle me. And see, for a spirit does not have flesh and blood, as you see I have. It says, and when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. But while they still not, did not believe for joy and marveled, he said to them, have you any food here? Let's stop there for a second. <laughs> have you any food here? Well, so Jesus is hungry. Jesus is hungry. That means he's flesh flesh and blood, and he's not a spirit, because I don't believe spirits eat. He says, have you any food? Listen to this. So they gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb, and he took it, and what did he do? Ate it, Ate it where? In their presence. John is saying that there are people that are going to come that are meaning to deceive. So the next time someone comes to your door and says, Jesus Christ did not come in the flesh, that Jesus, the, the man is dead, you can say, you are wrong. Not only are you wrong, but you are meaning to deceive. So John says, don't invite them uh, into your home. You're thinking, that's a little extreme, pastor man, isn't it? No, no, not at all. Let me say it like this. You remember before, before you met Jesus? A couple of you, anybody? Uh, you remember the people we used to run with before we met Jesus? You know how sometimes you might run into them? And they're like, hey, how are you doing? And they're like, oh, man, Jesus has just transformed my life. Oh, man, Jesus is doing some great stuff. I'm in church. I'm growing. I'm learning. Hey, what are you doing? Eh, kind of the same stuff. Really? So you go home and say, hey, honey, guess who I ran into? I ran into John. And your wife's going, womanizing, alcoholic, drug addict John? Yeah, we're going to lunch. She's like, uh, uh, no, you're not. At least not with John. Because what John wants to do is John wants to. Your wife is going to go, we've worked too hard on this marriage. We've worked too hard <laughs> going to church, having life groups, having Bible studies, hanging out with, uh, with, with people that, that want to see us grow in Jesus. We've worked too hard to have John come at the, the peak of your growth to pull you down. So you are not going with John. John is saying the same thing here. Don't let anybody in who doesn't believe like you do. Don't let anybody in and, and have fellowship with this. Be on guard for this. Now, does this mean that we, 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 we just shut out, we, we just have a little Christian commune? No. But this just means be careful who's pouring into your life. If you have friends in your life that aren't pouring into you, that aren't helping to build you up, helping to, to grow you and to encourage you in Jesus, Keep them at a distance because what other good is going to come from that? If they're not making you a, a better follower of Jesus, what do we do? Now, does that make sense? I'm not saying just shun everybody, but what John is saying that we don't need to be hospitable to antichrist, to people who don't believe the way we believe. And we're not, again, to stay in a little Christian commune, but we are to be careful on who we let in. So John gives them a warning. Hey, you don't need to be hospitable to people that are meaning to deceive. And I pray, pray, pray that that, that, that makes sense. Look to yourselves that we do not lose those things that we worked hard for. And you know what, family? We're working hard to, 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 to follow Jesus, and sometimes it's tough, but we put ourselves in life groups and, and Bible studies, and we're at home reading our words, we're at home, and we're trying to just walk this, this path, and sometimes not everybody wants to help us walk that path. You know what it's like to put in some hard work on something and then have somebody just come and just mess it up? Do we have any people that just 
that you, you admire your grass a lot. I mean, you, you, you love your grass. Anybody? <laughs> All right. So you, you edge it. You got some fertilizer on that thing. You got your timer set. You, your, your sprinklers are all in the right place to make sure that there's coverage. And then once in a while, somebody will do this to your grass. They'll go like this. And you go, da, 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 da. why are you walking on my grass? I love this grass. I've put some hard work into this grass. Don't just treat what I've put hard work into like it's nothing. There are people that want to walk on your walk with Jesus. They want to thrash your walk with Jesus. They want to put little darts in to your walk with Jesus. John says, okay, don't even open the door. Look through the peephole and say, oh, Antichrist is here. Let me let Jesus, <laughs> let me let Jesus answer that one. Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ, it says, does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, John says, do not receive him into your house nor greet him. Listen to verse 11. For he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. So we have thirdly, we have truth determines our fellowship. Truth determines our fellowship. And again, please don't leave here with uh, the thought that we aren't to love people. That's what First John was all about. And we're, not to, we're to love people. We're to pray for people. John just simply says, hey, there's a limit. There is a limit. We are to give people Jesus. We are a light on the hill. Does all this make sense? Don't leave here going, well, I can't be your friend. That is not what I am saying. If you still don't get it, I'll be outside later on and we can talk more about it. But that is not what uh, John is saying. We are to be in the world, just not of the world. But our truth determines our fellowship. And how do we have fellowship? We have fellowship with like-minded people. Many of you are here today because you love you some Jesus. So we are like-minded to encourage, to lift up, and to build, to, to uh, let you know, hey, keep walking towards Jesus. I'm going to keep praying for you. We are like-minded, and we need to continue to encourage one another. Again, John is letting the church know, be mindful of these traveling missionaries and teachers because some of them are antichrist. So John is saying, hey, if antichrist is wanting to have fellowship with you, there is no fellowship. They're meaning to deceive you and to steal from all the hard work that we have done in growing you. That's what John is simply saying. The Bible commentary says this, because they are deceivers, it would be a mockery of the Father and a sin against Christ to give those who deny the Son and hate the brethren a place of respect within the community of faith. So John is saying you got to keep these guys on the outside. Well, verse 12 and 13, it says, Having many things to write to you, I did not wish to do so with paper and ink, but I hope to come to you and speak face to face that our joy may be full. The children of your elect sister greet you. Amen. We are in the uh, an era of technology. You text and we email. Uh, has anybody ever sent a few too many emails when you should have picked up the phone? Has anybody ever had a misunderstanding with the text? You see, what we do is we send a text and someone interprets what we say. They, have, they put their own inflection. Well, they're like, why they say it like that? And they shoot back. And you're like, why they say it like that? So you shoot back. And all of a sudden, you're having an argument. John is saying, I've got a bunch of stuff to say to you, but I'm going to wait until we get face to face. So let's stop doing this so much. Pick up a phone and say, hey, I just didn't want any misunderstandings. This is what I was talking about. Or even, you know, hey, let's meet and talk. <laughs> Whoa, we can do things like that? Yeah, let's, let's meet and talk so there's no misunderstandings about anything. John is going, I've got a whole bunch I want to say to you, but I'd rather do it in person. I love stuff like that. Because sometimes we get a little courageous behind the phone, right? We get a little liquid courage there, but when it's face-to-face, -face, it's a little different story. So from time to time, say, hey, let's go grab some coffee or something. Let's meet and let's, let's talk. John says, there's a bunch of stuff I want to say to you, but I want to see you and speak face-to-face. -face. Why? It says, 
that our joy may be full. The Bible says we should rejoice with one another. You know how we should be happy and full of joy because someone else is happy? Anybody ever, ever do that? If something has happened to one of your friends and they share it with you? Yeah, that's a beautiful thing. But sometimes we're like, oh, why didn't that happen to me? It's not about you right now. John says, I want to be with you so our joy may be full that we might rejoice together. That your joy would be my joy, my joy would be yours. And how wonderful, family, if we were to live like that, the things that bring me joy, I want to share with you. I just want to, I just want to bless you. I gave my brother a, a, a little thing of water. May, may that be a blessing to you. What if we were just to take that same approach that may my joy be your joy? Maybe you know someone that's going through a really difficult time in life. Hey, right now, God is, is, is blessing. Let me, let my joy be your joy. Come hang out with me. Come, let me give you some of this. I met someone, I think, uh, a few weeks ago, and I asked them how they were doing it, and she said, uh, was it uh, fabulous, fantastic? She's over there. I was like, give me some of that. How are you doing? Fabulous. I'm like, that'll work. I want to spend time with people who are doing fabulous. And so sometimes we may not be doing fabulous, so you need to, hey, fabulous person, let's go grab some coffee. Guy to a guy, girl to a girl, of course. But spend time with people that love them some Jesus. Because all of us sometimes get a little low. Spend time with other people that aren't a little low. They're going to what? They're going to bring us up. They're going to bring us up in Jesus. John is saying, I want to spend time with you that our joy may be full. This, what a beautiful word, that our joy may be full. Aren't those beautiful words? That our joy may be full. I'm getting excited right now. we got to go. Two things to take home with you. Number one, is your foundation truth? Is your foundation truth? If your foundation is built upon anything other than truth, it's going to crumble. Is your foundation truth? What does the Bible say? Faithful are the wounds of a friend. None of us have ever told any of our friends, hey, lie to me. No, we say, tell me, tell me the truth. And I'm sure all of us have said at some point, do you really want to know the truth? <laughs> have you ever prefaced a statement like that? If you really want to know the truth, the question is, why do we have to preface it like that? Why can't we say, hey, I love you, but the truth is this? But we preface it like we didn't want to tell them. When did telling someone the truth ever become a wrong thing? When did saying, okay, this is the truth ever become like, well, let me prepare you for it? Why do we need to be prepared for the truth? Why can't we just receive the truth? We, we're planting some, some plants here. You know what we do? We, we dig a hole. We put the plant in there. We cover it up. We put some water in it. We don't say, okay. I hope you're ready to receive this. I'm going to put some dirt around you right now. Now, I'm not sure if you and the dirt are going to get along, but here's the dirt you've been given. Then I'm going to give you some water. I hope it all works out. Now, we're like, hey, here's a hole. Here's a plant. Here's some dirt. Here's some water. Deal with it. But instead of that, we're like, okay, well, I didn't really want to say anything. Is that love? Is that love to keep truth from someone? Well, they might get mad at me. I'm sure it won't be the first time, and it won't be the last time. So number one, what is your, is your foundation truth? And number two, how much truth do you require? How much truth do you require? God's not always into giving us signs. Um, are we looking for God to do something more than he's already done? Maybe some of you are wanting God to... Hey, by the way, I'm real. I'll see you in a few years. What are we requiring to, to believe? God, God's not going to do any more than this. He's not going to do any more than give us Jesus. He's given us Jesus. So what other greater thing can he do besides give us Jesus? What else is there? What, what do you require to follow you some Jesus? What do you require? How much truth do you require? Is God somehow going to say, okay, well, I, I really meant this. Well, I, I really wanted this for you. God has given us his Bible. He's given us his word. 
He's not going to do anything greater than give us Jesus. Yeah, there'll be some miracles sprinkled around throughout our lives, which is a beautiful thing. But it goes back again. How much truth do you require? He's given us his word. What are you doing with his, what, what are we doing with what he's already revealed? If this truth isn't enough for you, there's no truth that's enough for you. If this isn't enough for you, nothing is going to work. Nothing is going to convince you of anything if this isn't enough for you. You might be thinking, Pastor, man, that's a little harsh. I don't think so. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? The truth has been given to us in God's word. So we either receive it or we don't receive it. And uh, the, the, the sad part is, family, when you and I choose what truth to receive, we oftentimes miss what God wants to give us. When you and I choose what truth to receive, we're saying, I want this truth, but I don't want this. I want this, but I don't want this. What if God wants to give you this? And it might be a little difficult. Is that still not, not truth? So what we want to say is, God, I want to receive all of your truth, whether it's difficult, whether it hurts. I just want to receive all that you have for me. So let's stop picking and choosing from God's truth. What are we going to receive? God, just give me everything that you want me to have, and I want to receive that. So take these home with you and, and think about it. Is there anything right now stopping you from living the life that God has for you? Is there anything stopping you from loving the way that God would have us love? The only thing that's ever stopping us is, is us. Jesus, we need you. Jesus, we love you. Your word says if we love you, we need to keep your commandments. And Jesus, that's where we are today. Help us to, to keep your commands. Your, keep your commands of, of loving you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We need your power to help us to love you. We need your power and strength to help us to love one another. Jesus, help us to, to trust in you with all of our heart. To not lean on our own understanding, but to acknowledge you. Help us to do these things, Jesus. Help us to pray without ceasing. Help us to love fervently. You know in the areas, Jesus, where we just have some issues. We have some kind of impediment where we can't love the way you want us to love. But as we know, Jesus, there are no asterisks by your commands. Well, you're exempt from this area. Jesus, we need your help that we would love fervently. So Jesus, help us to start that now, that as we leave this place, that if we're, we're with someone, that we're going to walk hand in hand and just say, hey, I just want you to know that I love you. That we would start now, Jesus. And if we didn't come here with anyone, that as we have the opportunity to, to love on our, our coworkers and love on our friends, that we would begin today, that we would begin to love fervently, that we would love fervently those who are in our house, those who we work with. The, the, the brethren here. So Jesus, help us do great things in us and through us. Jesus, may we be lovers of truth. May your truth have a place in us. May your truth, as we read about today, will abide with us forever. Give us some courage, Jesus. Lord, we just need you in a great way. Thank you for my brothers and sisters here today. Thank you for your plan and your purpose you have for our lives.